waiting, waiting to, 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 to start, start and as soon as, as you are ready, ready they will, will be very happy. happy. Thank, Thank you. Uh, this, this is Alejandro, Alejandro Pisanti. Uh, from, from the National, National University of Mexico and the Mexico, Mexico chapter of the Internet Society. Society. Um, um, I am, am very thankful to Shiva, uh, Shiva Ramanian Mutusami, who is sitting uh, uh, at the right, right from my side, side from, from your left, left uh, end, end of the table, table for the young work, work he put in, in creating this session, session and, and giving it continuity from last years. years. Uh, the, the session will be uh, moderated and chaired by uh, by uh, Vincer. Uh, I will be an acting chair until he uh, picks up. This is the meeting uh, of uh, in 2011 in the Internet Governance Forum of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Core Values and Principles. We uh, were set up first uh, a year ago in Vilnius. Uh, the objective, as, as you may remember, the dynamic coalitions are, uh, were described by Nitin Desai in his days as chair of the, uh, of, of the Internet Governance Forum as potential formations that would emerge from the forum uh, spontaneously formed by people with similar uh, interests. We uh, have come together uh, around the idea that there are some design principles of the Internet which extend well uh, into the layers above, uh, including some of the ways that the Internet is adopted in society, uh, whatever field you look at, education, politics, uh, health, uh, and that it is important to keep an eye open uh, within the Internet Governance Forum's framework uh, on uh, these uh, very basic design principles, uh, interoperability, the end-to-end -end principle, uh, and, uh, and, and a few others. Uh, uh, one of the beauties of the thing is that there aren't that many. It's not a long list, but it's a very powerful list. And that we have to work together with other dynamic coalitions that are forming uh, that are concerned with uh, very important things like internet rights and, uh, and principles at a more political uh, or social level in higher layers, or with freedom of expression, uh, where again the technological support uh, has to be available uh, and has to be kept uh, open and interoperable. And uh, on the other hand, there are principles that can or not be supported by the, by the technological architecture of the net, like anonymity or identity or a, a proper management that allows for both, that can interfere uh, with, the, with the architecture if there's suddenly a legal order to design things in a, in a specific way. And uh, the dynamic coalition would be uh, working uh, produce some statements uh, of warning or of uh, support for things that could go either way. Last year, uh, we had a very lively meeting, and I'm sure this one will become lively as people uh, are, are, are free to, to, to enter the room, as well as to participate remotely. Uh, we had uh, some views which were quite different among the different participants. Uh, Maybe the most striking differences were uh, the expressions of a woman engineer from Lebanon who uh, was all for anonymity. She said one of the first values that she wants to see preserved on the Internet as a core value is anonymity. And her argument, which is on the record uh, of that session, is uh, anonymity is very important for us because that is the only condition under which women in countries like mine, meaning Lebanon and I'm sure many of the surrounding ones, uh, this is the only way, she said, in which women uh, and young people in countries like mine can have access to sexual uh, uh, and reproductive uh, health and conduct information. If we have to be identified, then we would just not be uh, free enough to access this information because it could create different reactions that we cannot predict. Uh, and on the other hand, the, we have a very young uh, man from uh, the host country, from Lithuania, coming into that discussion 
with the following statement. I believe, he said, uh, that we need uh, for this anonymity thing to end. We need uh, for everybody who comes onto, onto the internet to use it, uh, to be fully identified. And the reason for that is that Lithuania, on becoming part of the European Union and more active member of Europe, uh, is going to become a country of culture. Uh, we, ha we want to have everybody become potentially a culture creator, and we want for, for us to be able to make a living with that, we have to be able to protect our intellectual property rights. And the only way we think he thinks uh, he could do this is by making sure that everybody who makes a copy of anything on the Internet is properly identified, so you can follow up on that. So you can see that the, the views of the values on the Internet are as varied and diverse as the values people hold. And some of them can actually be enacted, some of them even of these opposite values can be uh, made compatible with uh, certain architectural uh, principles and some of them may actually be incompatible among themselves and may ruin if, if, there's a, an, if a government, for example, orders an implementation may actually ruin the way the Internet operates. At least uh, it may become, uh, as, as, as the, the old word for this goes, balkanized, fractionalized. So that's the kind of concerns that we are intending to address. And uh, from there on, uh, I will, I mean, with this introduction, uh, I will tell you the people who are on the, on, on the front panel. Uh, myself, Alejandro Pisanti, as I've mentioned. Uh, Dr. Vint Cerf, uh, who will be chairing it. As you know, uh, Dr. Cerf was uh, one, one, one of the key people at the start of the Internet, together with Bob Kahn, whom we are honored to have in the room. Uh, he separated TCP from IP, and uh, in, in, in taking that rib out of the original single being, he created, uh, they created uh, uh, the, the, the great opportunity that the Internet has become. We have Shiva Subramanian Mutusami, who is the chair of uh, ISOC, the Internet Society in Chennai. Uh, uh, an active business person and uh, civil society actor uh, with, with great experience. And uh, I'm honored also to have uh, on this panel, to, to sit in this panel with uh, Scott Bradner, who is now the chief independent genius for the Internet in Harvard. Uh, is that the correct job description? Uh, and uh, a, a long-standing creator and supporter uh, of uh, the, the evolution of Internet standards, of the IETF, the Internet Architecture Board, Steering Group, and almost everything else that can be done for the Internet. And a very, very, very uh, esteemed friend. Uh, so you can see we have the academic, the private, the civil society sector already sitting at the panel, and uh, we know and see that there are uh, government officials, so we have uh, all four sectors uh, present in the in the room all for stakeholders, and we hope to keep this multi-stakeholder as we did over the, for, for the work from last year. So, Vint, I will hand it over to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, Alex, and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'd like to start out by observing that Scott Bradner's initials are SOB, and that might also be an important um, indication of some kind. Uh, second, uh, Alex didn't mention that he's uh, chairman of uh, ISOC Mexico, uh, so we have two uh, ISOC chairs here. Uh, it's really a pleasure to discover that these institutions, uh, which were started so long ago, uh, continue to persist, uh, grow, and to be more effective. Uh, so the, uh, the topic is core values, and I think we could span a fairly broad discussion starting with the technological uh, values or principles that uh, help, help to make the Internet so persistent. Uh, and also able to evolve all the way up to and including uh, the social and economic values that the Internet uh, has uh, engendered uh, in part in consequence of its origins and the people who, uh, who built it. Uh, but I thought I would start out, uh, first of all, with some very important specific core values, and they are 32, 128, 16, seven or eight, 13, and 42. Now, it's an exercise for the reader to figure out what those numbers correspond to, but indeed every one of them is important to the Internet, 
although 42 is a red herring uh, drawn from Doug Adams' uh, wonderful writing, so long and thanks for all the fish. Uh, to go back in history, however, uh, to the earliest uh, notions of open networking, uh, Bob Kahn started thinking about this uh, while he was still at Bolt, Bareneck, and Newman before coming to DARPA in 1972. And although I'm uh, paraphrasing Bob, and if you feel I've left something out, you should react, uh, there were several things that uh, I noted. Uh, one of them is that uh, his notion of open architecture about networking uh, started out with the assumption that each distinct network would have to stand on its own and no internal changes would be required or even permitted uh, to connect it to the internet. So this really was intended to be a network of networks. Uh, the second uh, notion was that communications would be on a best efforts basis. So if a packet didn't make it to the final destination, it would be retransmitted from the source. Part of the reason for that is that some networking technologies didn't have any place to store the packets in between, uh, Ethernet being a good example. Uh, although it hadn't been, Ethernet had not quite been invented at the point that Bob was uh, writing these ideas down. Uh, the third notion was that black boxes would be used to connect the networks. Later, these black boxes would be called gateways, and then later, routers. There would be no information retained by the gateways about the individual flows of packets passing through them, thereby keeping them simple and avoiding complicated uh, adaptation and recovery from various network failures. So a, a memoryless uh, environment was attractive because of its resilience and robustness. And finally, uh, among other uh, important notions was the idea that there would be no global control at the operational level, that the system would be fully distributed. Uh, in the uh, prehistory of internet, work was done on the ARPANET, and out of that work came notions of layers of structure, with the lowest layers uh, bearing packets and bearing bits, and the higher layers carrying more and more um, substantive uh, content, substantive information. Uh, some people took layering to be a very strict uh, kind of thing, and the term layer violation was often bandied about. Uh, the notion of keeping the layers uh, ignorant of what the other layers were doing had some advantages. It meant that you could remove or change or re-implement a layer without having any effect on the upper or lower layers because the interfaces were kept stable. Uh, similarly, the notion of end-to-end -end, uh, allowed the network to be ignorant of the applications or the meaning of the bits that were flowing in the packets, and uh, those bits would be interpreted only by software at the end. Now, there have been debates about these two ideas subsequently, uh, and some uh, arguments have been made for permeability. It's, f it's pretty clear that in some cases, um, Let's even uh, say at the routing layer, it might be nice to know what's going on with regard to the underlying transmission system because you might decide that some path on the net is not appropriate for, uh, for use because it's failing. And if you don't know that, <clears throat> then the routing system can't know that it should switch to a different uh, alternative path. And one can make similar arguments at higher layers where there's, uh, for example, a loss of capacity if this is known to an application layer, the application might respond by changing the coding scheme uh, for, let's say, video or audio. So this notion of layering and uh, and end-to-end -end, uh, treatment uh, could be argued to be uh, not necessarily uh, absolute, but uh, it has turned out to be a very powerful notion because we've swept new transmission technologies into the Internet as they've come along. Uh, without having to modify the architecture. So in Frame Relay and X25 and ATM and MPLS uh, became part of the uh, tools for moving packets around, the basic Internet protocol layer didn't have to change, except for adapting it uh, by figuring out how to encapsulate an Internet packet into the uh, lower-level uh, transmission system. Interoperability was a key notion 
in the system, the whole idea behind the Internet was that if you could build something that matched the Internet's architecture and technical uh, specifications, then you should be able to connect to the rest of the Internet if you could find someone who was willing to connect to you. This notion of organic growth has been fundamental to the Internet's ability to grow over time. Uh, in the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, there are some other principles that have emerged. Uh, one of them, which, Scott, you might care to comment on, is that if you're going to do something, do it one way, not two ways or three ways or four ways. If you can get away with that, it's very helpful because then you don't have to figure out which way is the other party uh, uh, choosing to do this particular function. The IETF has also uh, underscored some other important principles. Um, there are no, there's no membership in the IETF. You can't become a member of it. All you can do is show up and contribute. And so it's a meritocracy. If your ideas uh, attract others, you may actually succeed in getting a standard uh, out of the IETF <coughs> process. If nobody considers your ideas to be particularly attractive, then you may not succeed. But the idea here, <coughs> here is that it's the ideas that count. Um, I think there's also a wonderful uh, quote from Dave Clark, who served as the chairman of the Internet Architecture Board in its pre previous uh, incarnation, the Internet Acti Activities Board. Um, Scott, I'm not sure I can get this exactly right, but it was something like, we don't believe in voting, something King, in kings. kings. What was voting, Sorry. Kings or voting. Yeah, we don't believe in kings or voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. And I would say that that principle continues to guide uh, much of what the IETF does. Uh, I have a bunch of other observations to make. I'm going to set them aside for the moment uh, and uh, turn to my fellow panelists and ask them to make a few remarks on, uh, from their point of view on what's important in uh, Internet principles. So, Scott, can I ask you to take the... Uh... I'd like to sort of pop up a level based on what Vint was talking about. The result of the, this, these principles that uh, Vint just articulated was a sort of a different, a higher level principle, which was the ability to innovate without permission. That. Um, you and I could agree on a new application and deploy it without having to get permission of the network to do so. Uh, this was a, uh, the initial driver and is still on the corporate environment, corporation to corporation, uh, a very strong ability. It's less so within a corporation because there's firewalls and within ISPs, which tend, so, which some of which filter to residences, but still on a one business talking to another one, it's been key. It is what allowed the World Wide Web to come about, because when, Hans, when uh, Tim Berners-Lee decided he was going to make things easier for physicists who didn't like to type and allow pointing and clicking, he could put together a, a browser and a, put together a server and distribute it to his friends, and they could start using it without getting any permissions from anybody. A very important thing. Another piece that uh, Vint alluded to was what is called the end end argument or end end principle from Dave Clark and others at MIT, Saltzer, Reed, and Clark, um, which can be paraphrased as to say, render under the ends what can be best done there. That the, that the network itself is agnostic to the traffic tra uh, going over it. It doesn't try and do a better job for traffic that it thinks wants better service. It doesn't look into the traffic to see that it's voice and therefore should be accelerated or something. This is a principle which is constantly under attack in that it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from the point of view of somebody who is focused on a particular application. Uh, somebody from the telephony world wanting to use the internet for telephony, and the internet is now the underlying connectivity for most, most of the world's uh, communication, and I'm, by internet here I'm draw drawing it broad as in the internet protocol and the way it's used, not all, it's public internet. They look at the internet protocol and say, well, but it doesn't do a very good job with voice. It's not tuned for voice. It's not architected for voice. 
Um, Bob Braden once said, he was a person on the, uh, on the Ar Internet Activities Board, Architecture Board that Vint mentioned, that op optimization was not one of the goals of the Internet Protocol. And it wasn't one of the goals of the Internet standardization. Flexibility and um, ability to create new things was. And so we constantly in the IETF come under pressure from various folks who want to make the Internet better for some particular application at the expense of other applications, because their application is the most important one, or at least to them. The rough consensus in running code bit that uh, Vint mentioned, there are two important parts of that. The ITF works on rough consensus. And this was mentioned earlier in another session I wasn't at, but it was paraphrased for me, that consensus in the original way that that term came, developed many, decade, many centuries ago was not that everybody agreed. It was that everybody had a chance to discuss, and even if there were a few people who disagreed, you could still move forward. Consensus in many standards bodies has come to mean unanimity, that everybody has to agree. And when you have it mean that, it means that you, your standard that you develop has to take into account all of the weirdnesses that any particular participant might want. So standards tend to be complicated, difficult to maintain, and difficult to understand. The ITF strictly believes in rough consensus, meaning that if some number of people really don't like the result, but they can't convince the, the majority, the vast majority, of the badness of the idea, then it will go forward. Uh, running code is that the standards process um, and the original standards process, the three-step standards process, where the middle step required that you actually had interoperable implementations of code before you could move forward. That's been actually, in the last few weeks, dropped to a two-stage process where the second stage requires that. The running code was not to prove that uh, somebody is interested. It was to prove that the standard was clear. So that if you implemented a standard and I implemented a standard, both reading the standard without Result, without uh, resorting to looking at other materials, and we could interoperate, that means the standard was clear enough. And the requirement for running code was to ensure clear standards. We also mentioned that the ITF has a tendency to go do it one way. That's true at one level and not true at another level. It is true when we're talking about a, 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 an approach to a problem where there is one architectural principle for that problem. It is not so true where there are multiple architectural principles. To take an example. The IETF developed an inter a, a internet voice protocol called SIP, Session Initiation Protocol. That is an end-to-end -end principle protocol. At the same time, we also developed a core-centric, a carrier-centric voice over IP protocol called Megaco. That's a, different, a fundamentally different architecture and different providers would use the different architectures in different environments. And they're both being used today in very different environments. They compete with each other at the result level, but not at the architecture and, 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 and implementer level. And so where we do tend to go to, go to try for a single solution is where it's just different, vari different variants in the same architecture, because then Vince absolutely right. If you have more than one way to do it, it just dilutes the picture. But having different architectures, different fundamental philosophies of how to approach something, trying to argue them into one bin can be completely counterproductive. You, you'll get the entire uh, the, the working group spending most of its time to uh, fighting that sort of thing. One other thing I want to bring up is that we have a constant pressure in the Internet community against the Internet. And the, the Internet here, I mean, is the Internet that Vint described. We have folks who believe that it needs to be optimized for one application or another, or folks that Alejandro mentioned believe that attribution is required for anybody who actually uses the net, a Internet driver's license, for example, um, or people who believe that different applications should have their own Internets. Governments should have a private Internet, for example.
Uh, these are constant battles, and usually the, what's brought up as rationale is protecting kids or fighting terrorism or something like that, but it's really fitting into a different architectural business model of control. A few years ago, one of the big U.S. telephone companies tried to get the FCC to require that Internet service providers architect their networks in such a way that all the traffic went through a common central set of switches. Their rationale, a stated rationale, was that this would be the only way that the, that the phone company could guarantee the quality of the connection is to go through the central point. And oh, by the way, this is a place that they could do wiretapping, which the government was interested in. But in reality, the, per the fundamental reason they wanted to do it was because that was a common taxing point where they could collect money. Well, the FCC didn't do that. In the U.S., the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, has been pretty much hands-off on the Internet. We've had almost no regulation there, letting these thousand flowers bloom, letting anybody innovate without having to get permission. Thank you very much, Scott. So, uh, Alex, would you like to add uh, anything to, uh, to this? Otherwise, I have a bunch of other bullets to shoot. Oh, well, okay. I will, I will just make a very brief comment. Uh, one thing that impresses uh, many of us who are uh, latecomers to the, to the use of the Internet, although I must state that uh, a couple of years ago I discovered in some printouts I had kept from a quantum chemistry workshop of 1979 that I was actually using ARPANET at that time yeah. wow. uh, to run things on computers in Berkeley and a couple of other laboratories in the U.S. from Bloomington, Indiana. So um, maybe not such a newcomer, but, uh, but I, I, I started as a user, certainly not as an architect. But one of the things that uh, uh, many of us find very impressive is how these uh, architectural and design principles first uh, are so fundamental, being very few, they, they, they really are fundamental to, to the growth of the net. And second, how they map well into some uh, social uh, and even political principles which are pretty sound and uh, I will not say universal, but helpful universally. Uh, and uh, some people have pointed also to the fact that uh, in the U.S., where much of this work uh, was done, as well as in, in Europe, in the years in which this work was being done by, by, by you guys, uh, it actually was so universal that two cultures that were almost opposite were able to, to shape it, which was a sort of more collectivist culture and, uh, and a traditional, uh, I will say, uh, Yankee in no despective terms, but just a characteristics. Uh, uh, a, a very strong uh, individualistic self-reliant culture and both were able to, to coexist and that is a witness for the robustness of these principles more so when we see that now the internet is implemented in so many uh, different political and cultural environments. Can I say something else? Certainly, Scott. Um, I want to build on that a little bit. One of the powers of the internet is the ability to uh, people to innovate end to end without uh, getting permission. But that is also one of the most basic threats of the net. Threats to society in the sense of the social order. We've seen in the Arab Spring there was the level of impact of the internet is varied but still it, it had an impact of allowing individuals to communicate that the state wouldn't necessarily want to be able to communicate. Many years ago, um, I was doing a um, series of tutorials for the Internet Society at Developing Country Workshops, and a representative of a, of a, a particular country came to me as an instructor and said that he really liked the Internet but really didn't like pornography. After a bunch of discussion, we concluded that no, he really was using pornography as symbol. That what he didn't like was information that would confuse the citizens. And that's a direct quote. And that is fundamental. The, one of the byproducts of not having that control point that Vint mentioned that Bob uh, had in his principles uh, 
is that you don't have a control point. You don't have a way to filter to say what people can say to each other. Some countries try very hard with different degrees of success. Uh, but the uh, Larry Lessig, once of Harvard, then of Stanford, now of Harvard, uh, said that the that code is law. And what he meant by that was that the design of the internet and the design of that kind of technology impinges on the ability of state control. You can't make laws to tell it to tell the net to do things that it's not architected to do, which is why the telephone company in the US wanted a requirement to re-architect the internet because the internet doesn't support the kind of controls that they believe they needed. So those are all very good points, Scott. Uh, a couple of other things might be uh, useful back in the technical domain. Uh, I would call uh, this notion design factorization. And to illustrate this notion, uh, I would uh, offer the uh, observation that if you read the protocol specification for the internet protocol, nowhere in that document will you see the word routing. Or at least I don't think there will be any mention of how that's done. The assumption is made that somehow a packet with the right format that is handed into the internet will find its way to the destination, but the details of how that routing is done is distinct and separate from the basic internet protocol. The idea behind this is to allow, for example, the possibility of multiple alternative routing algorithms, and indeed we have a number of them. Uh, so the point here is that by factoring things out, uh, you offer significant flexibility. Another interesting feature that was very deliberate in the Internet is that the Internet addressing space is non-national in character. We didn't start out with the assumption that we should identify countries and then allocate some address space to each of them. Rather, we started out with the notion that every address in the network is reflective of the topology of the network and the, and the way in which or where you connect to it. Uh, interestingly enough, despite the fact that that was an important principle and continues to be the case with regard to IP addresses, the actual use of the net, especially with the advent of the World Wide Web, has led to people creating tables that associate IP addresses with uh, national uh, locations and in some cases uh, even uh, more refined uh, identifiers uh, down to the city level. Uh, and it turns out that their rationale for this uh, has, as far as I can tell, not, not much or anything to do with control or identifying anything other than using this as a clue for what kind of um, response should be offered to uh, the party that's using the net. So as an example at Google, uh, when you uh, con try to connect to www.google.com, uh, and the domain name lookup is done, uh, our name server asks, where did this question come from? What's the IP address of the source? Uh, do I have any idea what country that might be in? And it makes a guess or it looks up in the table and, and hopes that it's correct. And then it vectors the party to whichever version of Google is specific to that country. So if you are here using internet addresses that are believed to be allocated to Kenya, the web page that would come up is not google.com, but google.co.ke. Uh, so this is intended to be a friendly uh, response to try to offer, for example, in, in language uh, uh, assistance. So in spite of the fact that the design principle was to be non-national, people who saw application utility in having some mapping uh, had to implement it themselves. I think it would be um, useful, I think, to move to uh, some non-technical kinds of principles that uh, have certainly been a powerful element of, uh, of the Internet's evolution. Uh, the openness uh, of the specifications uh, it turned out to be quite important. No one constrained access to the information about how to build the network. It was a very deliberate decision not to restrict the access to the design or the specifications, and even effort was made to produce uh, reference implementations of the protocols and make them available. 
probably one of the most important decisions made uh, in the time that Bob was at DARPA was to fund the implementation of the TCP IP protocols for the Unix operating system. Uh, initially, that work was done at Volt, Baranek, and Newman, and then uh, later uh, re implemented um, by Bill Joy at uh, UC California, University of California, Berkeley. The Berkeley 4.2 release was the first of the Unix implementations with TCP IP in it. And during that time frame in the early 1980s, this was a period when, um, a, when what do we call them? Um, they weren't personal computers yet. They were workstations. workstations. The notion of a workstation with an ethernet connection in a, lo a local area net uh, running TCP IP was enormously attractive to the academic community. So the consequence of making uh, this uh, application or the software uh, implementation of TCP IP plus the operating system available freely uh, was uh, certainly induced a rapid uptake uh, in the uh, academic community. This notion of freely available implementations, the notion of source code, the notion of freely av available specifications continues to permeate the internet environment and continues I think to stimulate its further growth. Uh, you can see uh, the same sort of thing happening in my company, for example, the release of uh, the Android operating system as source code or the Chrome browser or the Chrome operating system are all examples. And there are many others here in Africa, Ubuntu, which is one of the very popular versions of Unix is widely uh, used partly because it's freely available. So I think this notion of um, stimulating the use of the network by making uh, the, its tools and raw materials readily available has been an important part of its history and it should remain that way. The same thing can be said for application programming interfaces. Uh, when uh, Scott Bradner mentioned Tim Berners-Lee and the World Wide Web, it was the standardization of the protocols and the interfaces to them that has allowed so many new applications to be built on top of the World Wide Web. Another example of this exposure of, uh, of source code uh, was quite dramatic. When the World Wide Web was first released, one of the features of the browsers is that if you wondered how did that web page get built, you could ask the browser to show you what the source of the web page was. You could see the hypertext markup language. The side effect of showing people how this was actually accomplished is that they learned how to make web pages on their own. And so the notion of webmaster emerged out of the freedom to see and copy what other people have done and to experiment with new ways of implementing web pages. Over time, programs were developed to make it easy for people, easier for people uh, to create web pages. But the important thing is that this openness notion uh, permeated so many of the layers of the, of the system. So I think uh, we might want to move into some of the institutional uh, consequences of, uh, and principles in the internet world. Like to, Scott? I'd like to actually reflect on one of the points you made, um, World, World Wide Web and the, and the way that worked. One of the things I mentioned earlier is that um, the net is no longer quite as transparent as it used to be. Uh, we've got situations where there's firewalls and corporations and some ISPs and some countries are, are getting in the way and things like that. Well, one of the things that's happened is that what used to be the IP layer of the Internet, the layer where everything could be innovated on, has moved up to the World Wide Web layer, port 80. Uh, you can now, or the secure, the secure port for that. So you have new applications running on top of that. Um, where that is getting more and more important is with the HTML5, the new version of HTML, uh, which allows you to build things that look like applications within web browsers. And where this may have the most effect is actually on smartphones. Many smartphones have some levels of control by the uh, vendor as to what applications they will support. And with HTML5, which for example is being pushed by Apple, one of the ones that has very strong controls on what you can put onto the, onto the phone. Uh, you can build applications in HTML5 that would never get approved by the, by the uh, App Store and therefore have a whole new layer of this innovation without having to worry about control. 
So that's actually quite, we're big fans of HTML5 at Google too. Um, I wanted to, um, to note something about um, other th the ability of this system to evolve. It's one of the things that's interesting about the internet is that it's not a fixed architecture which is trapped in time. And so over the 30 some odd years that uh, it's been in operation, or nearly 30 years, um, it has evolved. And for example, uh, we've run out of IP version 4 address space and we have to implement a new version of the internet protocols which were standardized in 1996 uh, with 128 bits of address space, what's important is they can run together in the same network. It's not like you have to throw a switch somewhere. In fact, you know, even though the World Wide Web is a very important platform for many applications, as uh, Scott points out, it, it can also invoke non-HTTP protocols. And so when you're talking Skype or when you're talking you know, Google Talk or you're doing some kind of video, uh, interaction or some other application, you may very well be running multiple protocols at the same time, some uh, within the World Wide Web uh, environment and some below that level, right above UDP or IP or RTP or some of the other very low level bearing protocols. So this ability to invoke multiple protocols at the same time inside and outside the World Wide Web environment means that the network continues to be a place where innovation is possible. And I would not be surprised to find that there will be new applications and new protocols arising sitting on, on top of uh, IP or sitting on top of UDP or sitting on top of TCP uh, or possibly even others that come along. Uh, so that's a very important part of the evolution. Another example of that is the domain name system which was developed in uh, the early 1980s, 1984, 1985, uh, heavily invested in things encoded in ASCII. And uh, in the last several years, it's been quite apparent, it's been apparent for a long time, that not all languages in the world can be written using characters that are drawn from the Latin character set. So now we have internationalized domain names, and even, even though they ultimately end up being encoded in ASCII in order to uh, avoid having to change everything in the DNS to accommodate, uh, the point is that it's, it has been possible to evolve to a much richer uh, presentation of uh, naming than would have been possible if we had uh, stuck only with uh, the ASCII coding. So the, this notion of being able to continue to evolve uh, and exploit new ideas, exploit new kinds of, um, of transmission systems is a very important part of the longevity of the internet and its ability to uh, accommodate uh, new ideas. So maybe we could uh, push a little further up now into the institutional layer because you've seen institutions emerge out of the uh, internet experience. Uh, the most visible uh, technical one is the Internet Engineering Task Force. We've already talked a bit about that. Uh, the Internet Society uh, arose in part out of a belief that a society would emerge in consequence of people using the internet. And I think it's fair to say that we are seeing that. It's not one society, it's lots of societies and that's okay. They can run in parallel on the network and use whatever applications uh, seem to be best fitted to, uh, to human interests. Uh, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers emerged uh, out of this whole process. And the Internet Governance Forum that we're sitting at today emerged out of the WISIS and the Working Group on uh, Internet Governance. So these institutions have one feature in common. Uh, they believe in multi-stakeholder processes that are open and accessible to all who have something to say. And I hope that we are able to preserve that principle. Uh, there was a very strong statement um, to that effect by Larry Strickling, the head of NTIA, uh, in the uh, ministerial sessions on Monday. The reason that's so important is that it is the vital interaction of all these interests that give the internet the opportunity uh, to evolve new applications and new ways of serving the people who use it. Now, since you've joined us here, would you like to uh, offer some comments as well? Uh, my job in all this has been very easy. I uh, ask questions and uh, I've left uh, the answers to come from you. So I'm comfortable. you want to ask some more questions? Some more. Uh, one question is, uh, 
what can we do to preserve uh, core values and uh, are we doing enough to uh, preserve uh, the values uh, bits and pieces are happening in different parts of the world in one country it's uh, uh, legislation about uh, filters in another country it's on surveillance in some other country it's on um, some other uh, problem uh, so but uh, it, it, all this happens in complete isolation of uh, what is being discussed here and what can we do to prevent these values from being altered? So that's uh, my question to you. So <clears throat> I'm not going to try to respond alone to that question. I, let me make a couple of observations. We've already seen the utility and value of some of these core notions. On the other hand, it is not the purpose, in my view, of the Internet to jam its principles down anybody's throat. The Internet is not required. It's a thing that's offered for people to use if they want to use it. Uh, and I think the freedom to use the internet however you want to is a very important one. On the other hand, so I'm not sure that I would try to force everyone to behave the same way. Uh, I think though that we have to recognize that when the system gets to the scale that it is today, that it can be used to do bad things as well as good things. And I think that we have to accept that as a society, uh, we should be interested in protecting ourselves from bad actors. And the question is, how can we do that? What means do we have to do that? In what forum do we even talk about that? And the Internet Governance Forum is one place where we can and should talk about the harms that could potentially occur because the internet is so open and freely usable. So I guess I'd like to ask my two uh, other colleagues here whether they have a response to that important question. I mentioned that um, one, of the thing, one of the things about the internet, at least in the U.S., has been a lack of regulation. This has been a puzzle. Um, it, it just doesn't make any sense that something as important as the Internet has gone and succeeded to exist for as long as it has without any significant levels of regulation. And it, it's too important to the, it, the economic health and, and social health of the world to have that continue, at least in some minds. The, the net has um, succeeded because of the flexibilities and the principles that Vint and others have articulated. And it succeeded in arenas that the people in those arenas never imagined that it would succeed, particularly telecommunications. The telephone companies did not believe that the net would ever work. Uh, the competitor to TCP IP at the time it came up was X25. Um, and that made an assumption that somebody did one thing at a time. You put up a connection between you and one other thing. Uh, Vint mentioned that one of the things you get in the net is parallelism. You get multiple things going on at the same time. This has enabled a telephone company to be using IP in their backbone for a decade and not admitting it. Um, because, maybe because they really didn't think that they wanted to say that. Um, IBM in 1972 said in a IBM user group, quote, you cannot build a corporate data network out of TCP IP, end of quote. And the reason for that was definitional. By definition, a corporate data network had all of these quality of service and managerial controls, and, the, and TCP IP had none of them. It, the very organizations that fought the net because it wasn't optimal, because it didn't have controls, because it didn't do what they thought they needed to do, it's done. It's taken over. The net has taken over IBM. It's taken over the telephone companies. And they are in an environment that doesn't make sense to them regulation-wise. Um, there We are at a precipice, we've been at it for a while, um, where governments believe that the Internet is far too important to leave to the people who know what they're doing on a technical sense. Uh, 
and they need to imply some, impose some kind of controls. Uh, the President of France said that the Internet had no management and it was a moral imperative to fix that. Um, we're going to see more and more of that on the, on the organizational level. Vince talked about some of the organizations that have, have done wonderful things there. But we have to be continually vigilant in order to preserve these, these rights and these principles because to the folks like the guy who came to me and said that he wanted to control information that would confuse the citizens, the Internet doesn't make sense at a societal level where the aim of some societies is to control the society. It just simply doesn't make sense. And when something doesn't make sense, they want to fight it. Okay, uh, Alex, it looked like you had a question coming from the Twitter feed. Yep, um, the back channel is uh, active on several uh, platforms. Uh, there's a question coming in from the Twitter feed which uh, is made by, by a colleague in Mexico. And it uh, asks me to ask uh, uh, Scott and Vince uh, what they think of Microsoft's efforts to control the hardware to access the Internet, and that refers to the UFI stuff. The we, are, sorry, we are reminded that UN rules do not allow ad hominem attacks, so we are invited to express opinions that can be uh, grounded on fact. This, this current effort, the current thing that's probably being referred to is the boot, the authoritative boot process. This actually comes from a patent that Dave Farber and a few other people had from a number of years ago, and it, there was a big organization put together to, um, to commercialize it, called the Trust and Computing um, Forum or Trust and Computing Environment. Uh, there was a big play on that a few years ago where the aim was to, to say that um, you could have a, a platform, a computing platform, which, you, which content providers could actually trust. In theory, if I control the computer that's sitting in front of me, no, there is no theoretical way to have a digital rights management that allows a content control, content, content producer to ensure that I'm only using the content in a way that I've paid for. It's theoretically impossible to do if I control the platform. Trusted computing environment is hardware that allows the content owner to better control that environment. Uh, the chips to support that have been in most PCs for eight or nine years, maybe even longer. They were in Macs for a while, but Apple dropped them, not, not saying why. It's Apple's forte is not ever saying what they're doing. Um, and the latest thing is simply an incantation of that. It, it's, it's making use of the functionality that's been there for a long time. The arguments in favor it are very strong. If you control that environment so that only software which has been approved can be run, you get rid of all viruses because the viruses aren't going to be approved. Uh, and you get rid of all worms and you, you, you have an environment where the user doesn't have to know how to protect themselves in order to protect themselves. And there's a lot of power to that. But the other side of it is that the computer owner can control what you can do. And the controversy that arose recently was whether the PCs that were built to, in order to support this boot functionality, secure boot functionality in Microsoft, could remove, refuse to run Linux and other, and other, and other uh, operating systems. And Microsoft has assured the community uh, that that's not their intent and that they will ensure that that's, that, that that's not blocked. But it is, it's, it is that level of control um, that has been desired by the content community for a very long time. They've been fighting very hard over an environment that they have no possible way of controlling and don't like it. Uh, Scott, I actually have a somewhat different interpretation of this, so this may be an interesting debate. Uh, there has been a uh, focus of attention on protecting machines against uh, the ingestion of malware. And the most vulnerable moment in a machine's life is when it boots in the operating system. And so the idea that the machine won't boot in a piece of code that hasn't been digitally signed uh, is a pretty powerful protection. 
uh, it feels to me as if your observations made a fairly big leap from the ability to assure that the boot code hasn't been modified to uh, the assumption that somehow that would inhibit all forms of, of uh, other operating systems or anything else. And I'm, I think that one has to be a little careful about under what circumstances uh, a chunk of boot code is signed and by whom and what that boot code is allowed to do. Uh, you're absolutely right and you're wrong um, in that the TCE was specifically designed the, the Farber patent is specifically talking about sequential boot with signed blocks. That's exactly what it's for. But the hardware in it involves a set of functionality that include, for example, remote attestation so that a content owner can ask your PC whether it is running particular software, particular flavors of the software generations and things like that, particular operating systems, and refuse to Downloads, download content unless you are, for example. It's specifically built into the TC functionality. Nobody is currently implementing that. Microsoft currently is talking about only the boot process. Um, but in the, chip, the chip that supports that supports all the way up the stack to that nothing can run on the machine that you don't approve. That the, that the machine the machine manager, and I'm carefully saying it's not machine owner because there's a difference in concept of whether if you bought the machine, are you the owner when somebody else is saying what can boot on it? Um, it's a philosophical question of whether you own the machine under that condition. But certainly, Microsoft at the moment is only talking about the boot process. It's not just Microsoft. I mean, this, this proposal uh, to use uh, strong authentication of the and validation of the boot sequence uh, is proposed for uh, all machines and all chips. Uh, the chip makers have been asked specifically to implement that. Uh, again, uh, the intent being to uh, avoid having the machine boot up a piece of malware. Uh, I think the correct formulation to get to your point is that it is, whoever is able to sign the boot code is the party that has control over whether the machine will run uh, that particular boot sequence. Uh, by the way, there's another little nuance to this. If you're going to update the boot sequence, you also have to check to make sure that the proposed new boot sequence is also digitally signed. Uh, so the issue here is who is the party that can sign that boot sequence? If it turns out to be a particular manufacturer, maybe it's Microsoft in this case, that would be different than some other party uh, that you might or might not trust. Uh, I have a, a concern about time, and so I'm going to suggest that we uh, try to open this up to uh, interaction with the people who have joined us uh, for this session, if that's okay with you, Alex. So um, if there are people who would like to raise questions either from the floor or possibly online, um, if, uh, Sebastian, have there been any uh, online questions? Okay, so why don't we uh, start with you? Thank you, Vint. Uh, we have a question online from uh, Olivier Crépin Leblanc. Uh, the internet could be anything from a free for all network where everything and anything is allowed, including criminal behavior, to the other extreme of content provider or government controlling it, filtering it, listening to it through deep packet inspection. How can we solve the challenge of finding the right comfort zone between those two extremes? Are there, sorry, are there makers to look out for? Are there any early warning signs that we should watch out for that will tell us we are going too far in one direction or other? Thank you. So Alex or uh, Scott? Or you start. I start, okay. Uh, so first of all, it's clear that we don't want the extremes. It's also clear that um, I, at least I would like to propose that, uh, that we don't want a network which is so open uh, to um, abusive behavior that we, not only do we not feel safe, uh, we are not safe, uh, and that uh, our privacy is uh, eroded or lost, our security and confidentiality are eroded or lost, and they could be eroded or lost in both directions, even a network which is completely and totally transparent and controlled by the government is not going to stop. That will lose all of our, uh, all of our privacy. 
uh, and confidentiality. On the other side of the coin, if it's completely wide open, we already have worked examples of people penetrating the machines, creating zombies, and so on. So there has to be uh, uh, some place in between. And it's my belief that there is no uh, solution which is purely technical in nature. I think there are a variety of technical ways of increasing the safety of the network. We implied some of them in this talking about uh, the secure boot. Uh, but that will get us only so far. Uh, then we have to deal with the fact that there are people who will use this facility to uh, exercise abusive behavior and maybe even attempt to cause harm to others or uh, extract uh, value from, uh, uh, from them. Uh, and in, the only way to deal with that is to detect the problem and then come to fairly broad common agreements, fairly widespread common agreements, that those behaviors aren't acceptable. And if they are detected, that there will be consequences. That still leads to a question of how you find the perpetrator. And this leads to uh, questions of attribution. It leads to questions of reciprocity across national boundaries. Uh, it leads uh, to uh, legal agreements about coping with uh, these un unacceptable behaviors. Uh, and I think we are going to have to have discussions in the Internet Governance Forum and possibly in other forums in order to establish norms that are uh, acceptable on a fairly wide scale. In the absence of any decisions along those lines, I don't see how we will enact any protections that are worth uh, anything at all. And finally, we can't stop people from doing bad things. And because we can't stop them, uh, the only other thing that we have to do is to tell them that they shouldn't because it's ethically wrong. Uh, and that's uh, the kind of educational thing that uh, we ought to be teaching kids uh, as they grow up to, uh, to value uh, national values and family values and other things. You, know, you wouldn't want to harm, you wouldn't want other people to harm you. This is the golden rule all over again. So we have all those three possible ways of dealing with the problem. Somehow we're going to have to work our way through to a place that is largely, let's say, roughly comfortable for everybody. Scott. I'm going to add a little bit of flavor to some of the things that Vince said. Um, Deep pack and inspection won't stop the bad guys uh, because they, if you remember in World War II, the U.S. Uh, impo uh, in, um, employed Navajo Indians to uh, co speak code, and the code they spoke was their native language. Um, even if you can intercept something, assuming that it's unencrypted, which is a bad assumption, then um, you can talk in a code which allows you to actually communicate and many dissidents in many countries have found this out. So that deep packet inspection is not quite the um, killer of communication that some governments might like or uh, some businesses might want. Um, but it is still a, definitely a risk. It's still definitely a threat to one's, one's um, pers personal uh, life and, uh, and privacy. Uh, the question of attribution that Vint brought up is actually a very powerful one. There's a great paper from uh, Dave Clark and Susan Landau on attribution and the difficulty of it. In particular, attribution is being able to determine who sent you something or who did something to you. Um, with the kind of attacks that we're seeing today, you om the attack almost never comes from the, par the party that's controlling the attack. It almost always goes through one or two or four or seven or 25 middlemen. Um, somebody hacks into a computer, a student computer at Harvard and uses that as a stepping off point to another student computer at Harvard, to a student computer at MIT, to a student computer someplace else, to somebody's home computer, and then finally attacks the Pentagon. And so if the Pentagon says, oh, we're under attack, we're going to nuke who uh, who is attacking us and they use the source IP address for that, they're going to nuke some grandma. And that's probably not what they need, they have in mind. So, so there aren't any easy answers. Uh, attribution or holding um, countries accountable for what happens from them. There was a, if you look at the, uh, I think it's the Potomac Institute had a video conference a couple of, a couple of months ago about that where uh, one of the proposals was exactly that, to hold countries accountable for any attacks, any cyber attacks that come from within the country. 
but that doesn't stop somebody from the U.S. breaking into a, commu a computer in Bulgaria and then using that to attack China. Um, there's, the attribution is very, very difficult. Uh, we did that in many years ago with pirates and places where you could actually have some control. Um, there, was a, a, there was a doctrine of accountability that countries were held accountable from bandits that came out of their territory or pirates that came out of their territory. That doesn't really work in the modern internet. Alex? Thank you, Vint. Uh, to, to add to, to these re replies to Olivier uh, Crepin Leblanc's question, uh, the, the signs that something is going to go wrong, uh, in, in, in what I understood uh, of, of the question, uh, are very much embodied and contained in what has been said by Vint and, and, and Scott. You know something is going to begin to be weird when you see uh, a mix uh, of responses to behavior problems on the net that leans too heavily on technology and too little on the, on the behavior that it actually wants to regulate and where the technological solution creates more problems than it is intended to solve or is just unachievable. Uh, the attribution problem, as uh, has been mentioned by, by, by Scott, is uh, very important, as Vink has said, no law actually prevents crime. I mean, we have terrible laws uh, that, that, that say you shan't, thou shan't kill. And there's uh, even the possibility in many countries of being killed for killing. And people continue to kill. Uh, so we have to go back to our basic social problems and make sure that we do more with the Internet than against the Internet to solve them. Okay, are there other? Oh, Scott? One other note that one of the approaches that some governments have worked on and, and law enforcement proponents frequently talk about is to require ISPs to record the activities of their, of their users. So to keep track of every website you go to, every email message you send. Uh, this is something that's technically possible to do in the Internet. But imagine this in the, real, in the physical world a government that requires every letter to be opened and copied and recorded. Would that ever survive in the, in the physical world? But that's something you can technically do quite easily in the Internet world, and there are many governments that want to do that. Yes. In, in line with uh, what Scott said, if a government wants uh, data to be retained, it can only go to ISP. And uh, if it wants something filtered, it can go to another business, a search, in, search, search engine company. So if these business, businesses increase their uh, resistance or uh, if they team up better and uh, try and uh, convince governments that uh, this is not right or uh, this is against the values, then can this happen? If the ISPs uh, say no, how could governments have uh, all the information? Okay, Alex, uh, thank you. Uh, I think that we have, uh, according to my clock, just about five minutes left. So uh, are there administrivia that you believe we should be uh, tackling? Yes, Vint, thank you. I think that uh, especially after seeing other uh, dynamic coalition sessions not treat their organizational stuff in public and on the record, I think that we are, I mean, particularly uh, stressed to make sure that the path forward for the dynamic coalition is uh, at least set out in a proposal in this session. Um, given the questions we have uh, received, the, the pretty broad nature of them, uh, recognizing visually many of the participants physically present in the session, uh, I think that we can safely put forward the following proposal, which is that uh, I, I, I will put forward my volunteer effort, and I'm counting on Shiva's continuing volunteer effort. He's uh, a man of incredible strength and, and initiative. Uh, and whoever else wants to volunteer uh, to be a core group to move the dynamic coalition forward. 
What we need to do is to produce a report, which we can easily do from, from this session. Shiva and I can, can take that responsibility based on the transcript, uh, put it forward, put it up on a, on a, on a blog, which will, be, which will announce, uh, and make sure that it gets uh, proper comment so that it's a, a faithful uh, rendition of the session. Uh, I mean, it, it's, 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 it, it, I mean, we have the accurate transcript, but we'll have a summary that, uh, that, that people can use without reading the whole transcript and with, you know, without the, the ums and ahs uh, of, the, of, of the transcript. Uh, then uh, also uh, try to get some continuity uh, for this dynamic coalition. What the dynamic coalition can actually do now, uh, as far as I can see with the people here, is basically set up a very lightweight observatory uh, in which we uh, keep track of the most visible, at least, and facilitate uh, other people uh, keeping track of initiatives that uh, either by being restrictive or uh, by, you know, by proposing things like filtering, blocking, and so forth, or by putting forward sets of principles, sets of uh, uh, policies, uh, digital agendas, and so forth, may have uh, an impingement, an impact on the, or, or new requirements on the evolution of the Internet's architecture. To make sure that uh, we continue to have a dialogue in, in this conversation, continue to have a conversation uh, with uh, the private sector, with the technical community, with researchers in the academical community that are making sociological and political science research about these things, uh, government and civil society, and to promote the activity around this. I think that for now we would not have an immediate pressing need of establishing uh, membership rules for the dynamic coalition, bylaws to regulate the behavior in detail, uh, and stuff like that, which has been found necessary in another dynamic this coalition. Is, this is the internet. It's okay. uh, so it's the internet. We do it the internet way. And when we have a problem to solve, for which the solution are rules, we start seeing who's there and, and, and solving it. For now, what we want to do is keep this more, more, more stress more the dynamic than the coalition side of dynamic coalition and make sure that we can make it useful and valuable over the coming year. Uh, I would. Uh, emphatically ask for comments on that. Sounds good to me. Uh, well, I'm certainly happy to help uh, craft whatever draft documents you have in mind, but I hope that we would get a lot of feedback from others who are interested in this same topic. Well, I think uh, we've run out of time. Oh, six, Sebastian. Yeah, uh, uh, Sebastian, not as a remote uh, uh, participant uh, moderator. I, I, I think what, what uh, um, Alessandro suggests, it's a, it's a very good way. I would like to add one point. As we are the core, it's Internet. I think we can show that Internet is a good tool to help the dynamic coalition to work. And maybe we can be also the core of what, how could a dynamic coalition could work. We need certainly some ideas, some tools, some people, but I am sure that we can uh, pave the way for others uh, using the Internet with the right tools for the future in the Dynamic Coalition. And I think it's important for the future of the IGF itself, because uh, working group, it's, it's okay. Dynamic Coalition could be the way to go from one IGF to the other. Then let's try to do it, and I am sure with the people around the table and in this room and uh, uh, connected, it will be possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I think that uh, at this point we have to call the uh, session to a close, but thank you all very much for participating. We look forward to uh, hearing more from you in the future and, uh, of course, seeing you the rest of the week. Thank you.